Welcome back to The Rhonda Swan Show. Well, today's episode is gonna be quite different because most of the guests that I bring on have, well, most of them I don't, haven't really met them yet. I don't know as much about them. However, my guest today has a bit different of a story. Now, you might wonder, who would I bring on that I know so well and why would I actually wanna interview them? Well, how I'm gonna start this episode off is I'm actually gonna read you something. I'm gonna read you an excerpt from a poem that my guest wrote. And I want you right now to just really take this in. Someday this moment will fade away. The seconds we are living now will become only a memory to us. When we toil in the future or the past, we forget about the present and waste the only seconds on this earth we are truly guaranteed. The moments we are living now. Think about that. When we focus on the present, we forget about the past and the moments that we are living now. Well, my guest today is what some may call a unicorn, but we're gonna address that today because she's had an untraditional life. She's gone and lived all over the world and experienced six continents and 30 plus countries of her own living for the first 15 years of her life. So today my guest is not only my daughter, but she's also a very successful fashion designer and artist. She's an author and she is a very special human being on this earth. So I would like to welcome my favorite daughter, Hanalei Swan to the show. <laughs> what a beautiful introduction, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really hope I'm your only daughter as well. Yes, you are. You're my favorite. <laughs> You're definitely my favorite, but more, you are my only. More than the dogs? Well, you know, I mean, Buttercup is my favorite dog daughter. Yes. Yeah, we have one of the dogs here. I don't know if anyone can see it. She's, she just chose a perfect spot. But Churcher Church is right here on the stage with us. <laughs> and um, Living your best who's, life. Yeah, but whose dog is Churro? Uh, it's kind of She's Yiddish. like everyone. Yeah, she's everyone's. And then we've got another dog named Oreo, but we hope Oreo doesn't come in because she's wild and crazy one and she likes to bark. Yeah. All right, Hanalei, well, this is not the first time you've been on this show. No, it is not. Yeah. And I, I read that poem that you wrote in the opening of the book. Can you elaborate on where that really came from? Yeah, so originally, I remember you talking to me about this new wealth edition of Woman Gone Wild. I wrote one of the chapters in the first book, mm -hmm. which was kind of just our stories about what does being a wild woman mean to us. But now it was the wealth edition, this new book, this new inspiration. And at first, when I was hearing about this, I was completely clueless of what to write. Because I'm like, my whole thing isn't about wealth. My passion isn't making money. That's not what I'm passionate about. What would I have to contribute to a book that's all about wealth? And then I remember listening in on one of the calls talking about this book. And I remember hearing that this book is the, redefine, uh, the redefining of wealth. What does wealth mean to you? It's not about money. It, it can be about money, but it doesn't have to be. It's what wealth means to you. And that really got me thinking. So I started journaling what does wealth to me? I looked up the definition. I looked through all these different ways to understand the single word. Wealth is a um, abundance of valuable things. And so I'm like, what do I find valuable most in my life? What do I define as wealth? And I really started reflecting about this. And what came to me was through traveling over these last 15 years of living, <laughs> being able to grow up all around the world, being able to just experience so many new things through travel, I, and like especially uh, moving almost every three months or less to a new place, a new home, a new school, new people, new environment, one of the most important things to me was never about money, never about clothes, never about expensive things you could buy because every single time we would move, we would give mm. all of our things away. So a lot of times I didn't even value 
the valuable things in life that we pay so much for, that people work so hard for. The most valuable thing for me was my memories and experiences because those were irreplaceable. I could never give them away. No one could ever take them from me. And so over these years, I've learned to collect these memories, collect these experiences of traveling to new countries, learning in different ways. We don't realize that learning doesn't just have to be in our school system. You don't just have to go to a class to learn. We learn from the environment we are in. We grow from our environment. We are like sponges picking up energies based off of people, lessons, conversations. These teach us to be the human that we are now. And so, yeah, growing up, what I found most valuable in my life was sharing these little moments with family. Uh, I remember spending moments where dad would tell me stories of him growing up or surf stories or I would be able to watch you speak on stage. And that really inspired me to want to not only save these memories that have built up my life, but to also live a fulfilled life mm. as well. So. Yeah, I mean, it's so, I, I, whenever I listen to you, I, you know, obviously you're my daughter, right? However, there's so much wisdom that comes from everything that, that you say. I mean, you wrote your very first book. What, how old were you? I think I was like nine, maybe eight. Yeah. Yeah. You are nine or, nine or eight, and you launched your first company when you were how old? When I was about 11. 10, yeah. 11, kind of started around that age. What do you think, Hanale? has put you in this space of understanding? Like what, what experiences in your life that, you know, we, what we've brought you to, dad and I have put you in, you know, a lot of different environments. What do you think it was? Do you ever remember one moment where you're like, you just, you just, things just started to click or you understood things differently than most kids your age? I think to pull it back a little bit to like kind of bring to that cord fighting moment. Cause I did say, I started my first company when I was like, a 10 11 yeah. I uh, wrote my first book when I was even younger like all that to bring it back to like the how did that happen beginning. when did that happen it was originally when I got asked the question what do I want to be now instead of what do I want to be when I grow up yeah so I remember I remember the day that we asked you that question on the beach in fact we should roll this clip right now because I remember asking you Hanale I think I did say, you know, what do you want to be to, when you grow up? And I said, but did you realize that you can actually do that now, yeah. right? And I remember there was a bing, there was a moment. You can see it. In fact, let's roll it right now when I asked Kanale this. And you were like, your eyes lit up. Do you remember that moment? Like, what happened? Yeah, well, in the moment, I remember just like, when you ask someone, especially so young, like I remember I was listing tons of things I wanted to do. Like, I feel like especially as kids, there's like no barrier on what you can truly do. Mm. You know, like there's no like, oh, what if I don't have enough money to do this? There's no setbacks, there's nothing. It's just like inspiration. It's like that core inspiration we get that does with no limits, no limiting beliefs yeah. at all. And I remember in that moment, I was just really excited because I'm like, what can I do? Yeah. And like, I remember being seven. So of course I'm like, some of our closest people in our life, I'm like, oh, I want to be like them. I want to do this. I want to create stuff. But I remember the main thing that I said, I just want to be able to make things. I want to make fashion. I want to do photography. You said I wanna be, yeah, you said I want to be wanna, a fashion designer. Yeah. I want to be a photographer. Like you already had spoke those things into existence. Yeah. What do you think? holds most kids back like most kids are asked what do you want to be now and they just why do you think kids reply with i want to be a police officer i want to be a fireman like why do you think that is because i think that's the core yeah. of that i want to get to yeah i think that a lot of it was something i've realized and something that i've seen just based off of the people i've met in the past based off of people i've seen is a lot of times parents put their expectations mm. or their dreams that they wanted to accomplish but never got to when they were younger because people didn't support them because they didn't ever have 
a open mindset that they could do anything. So all of the dreams that they had when they were kids and never got to do, I feel like I see so much time kids, they especially like this generation, them. they're these parents are putting so much pressure on them to be who they wanted to be, to have their dream, a uh, dreams live through their kids, you know? Yeah. And that kind of just like ignores what the kids actually want to be. Do you think too that kids might just say things because they want to please their parents? Yes. As well as like, we all pick up things energetically. Even if you don't believe in it, there's just, you know, that feeling that you get mm. just from certain people. Some people you're heavily like, wow, I really want to be friends with you. And some people you're like, oh, they kind of feel weird to talk to, you yeah. know? Yeah, you can even, feel the frequency, right? Even, yeah, if you don't believe in it or anything, but there is, no matter what, there is that gut feeling yeah. we have, that intuition we have. Mm. Um, and so I... Um, yeah, because <laughs> I think that, like, that, kids, yeah. they do, yeah, I mean, it's like they, they end up wanting yeah. to please people, right? We pick up on the uh, yeah. energies that people yeah. give us. So, like, if you say something and yeah. someone gets excited about it. Yeah, of course. So do you think part of that, like... You know, I think you've been raised a bit differently. Mm -hmm. Why? What? How do you think you were raised differently that made you not try to just please Dad and I? You know, because I think you've you've been you've been really trudging your own and digging your own trail mm -hmm. as you've been coming along and growing up. Because how I've grown up, especially how you've like framed things or how you've like kind of shown the world to me in a way, it's like you've almost allowed me to find independence in my own way with still being able to be okay with asking for help. Mm. Like, it's not like, oh, just do this in your own thing, just figure it out. You're like, hey, you can create this, but we're here to support. I think in everyone's life, we need support. If that's from a family member, if that's from a friend, if it's from a colleague, uh, someone you work with, we all need support in one way or another. And some people don't realize that they're like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I have to do everything on my own. But one thing I've realized is that you have to find people that can help you. You have to find that quote unquote dream team that can support you and show that support through what you're doing, through growth and learning. Um, and oftentimes I don't believe that a lot of people realize that they can show support, you know? Um, but the difference between uh, how I've grown up and the difference between how a lot of kids is you guys have been able to show that support with what I do and make me think in different ways other than our conformed normal think inside the box ways of you have to go to school you have to go to college you have to get a job you have to get married then you can do what you love and retire once you have enough money it's a system that we're put into to think that this is what we need to do to survive and to maybe take a vacation every year so we can maybe live off our bucket list one day. Well, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to listen to this and be like, mm -hmm. first off, who is this kid and why does she even, you know, have the ability to speak this way? Um, have you ever felt like you were unusual or weird or different than other kids? Yeah, definitely. Um, I hung out with adults the majority of my time growing up because oftentimes I would go to school and stuff, but then uh, growing up, I would go to so many entrepreneurial events, mm. which most of the time, like probably 95% of the time, it's all adults. And so growing up, the people who I would speak to in the environment I was in was all people most likely double, triple my age and conversations that were mainly based around entrepreneurialism, finding independence, finding support, doing life, uh, making your life on your own terms. You know, that's, that's the mindset I grew up in. And I'm so thankful of that, for that. But I remember when I started to, uh, when I was like about nine, 10, uh, more closer to that age, whenever I would go to school, I felt a lot more isolated mm -hmm. because I felt like I couldn't resonate with a lot of kids my age. Why do you think that is though? Because um, they didn't because have the same open yeah, minds because yeah. they weren't in the same environment I was yeah you know like you know who you are let's say uh the people who you hang around with now let's say you had to completely scratch the people who you hang out with and you had to go to someone who had a completely different belief system a completely new environment 
it would feel unsettling. It wouldn't feel close to your values at all, and it wouldn't be the people you want to be around. Mm. Um, I was having to, uh, when I was going to school, I was almost having to put on a mask to try being someone else who I wasn't. I was getting bullied for a while, and I stopped doing what I loved, which was creating artwork, uh, like talking about my life, doing the things I was most passionate about. I stopped because um, I didn't want to be the weird kid of the group. I yeah. didn't want to be different. I wanted to fit in. What do you, why do you think kids do that to each other, though? Like, what do you really, what do you think it really comes? Because I remember when that happened, and you didn't tell us for like over a year. Yeah. You know, and, and then one day you literally broke down and shared that, you know, because you stopped doing video, you stopped doing all the things that we you, that were lighting you up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what, like, how did you feel at that time? Like, where did, what, you know, bring us to a space where you were at when, at that age. Yeah, it felt like um, conformity is safety, mm. you know? And when we are adapting and being like the group, being like the herd, we are safe. When you step outside of the box and do something different, you're now put in a spotlight almost. Yeah. And really, I just want, especially around like my friends or the people who I would call my friends, I didn't want to feel isolated. So I conformed to the things that they liked, the things that they did, so I wouldn't be cast to the side in a way. So I stopped doing what I love. I started being a person I wasn't. And this was before I could even see what, was, what I was doing to myself. I just thought it was normal. I just thought everyone needed to do that. Be someone who they weren't just so other people could like them. And so you're almost put inside this one-way mirror box and only until you are able to break the glass and step outside, you could actually realize I was in a glass box. I was in something that was containing me. And so when you step outside that box, finally come to a realization, you can look outside and say, wow, there's so much of a better world out here. It's so much brighter. There's so much more light. But that's only when I was able to look inside myself and realize, am I happy? Am I being the person I want to be? And am I showing up as myself? Because I remember coming back from school every day, feeling completely drained, feeling tired, and almost becoming an entirely different person whenever I got home. You know, mm. there was a complete separation between yeah. showing up What would up you say school. then to, because there's a couple of things that I, that I saw from that. Yeah. Um, I could see like we were, I was asking before, do you think um, kids say what their parents want them to say so they're accepted, mm-hmm. right? Kids do it for their parents and kids then also then do it to their friends. Yeah. So what would you say to someone that's your age or maybe that has gone through, like how did you get through that? Because I remember there was a bold day where you actually had to stand up to the bully. Yeah. And it was hard because she was friends with all of these other friends that you had and you had to st- actually stand up for yourself and you were only about 10 or 11. Yeah. What would you say to another child right now, a kid, a teen that's in your space, like, like how to actually handle that and what to do? Yeah, um, what I would say is like, it's, it's something that has to come to is you slowly over time, at least I can only speak from how my circumstance was, Mm. but I was putting on masks. I was being someone who I wasn't to blend in with the crowd. And I slowly began uh, began to realize I wasn't happy doing that. And all the things I was doing was something I didn't like. Mm. Something I, that wasn't, wasn't something that made me happy. Every day I would come back from home and paint or something, or I wouldn't even have the energy to anymore because I was constantly drained. And so I'd actually reflect like, is this, are the people in my life right now bringing me joy? Mm. Or are they uh, like lowering how I feel? Are they making me feel more negative, self-conscious? Like in my head, I would beat myself up so much, be so critical of myself. But those words weren't coming from me. They were coming from someone else and they were amplifying in my mind to make it think that this is what I'm supposed to be thinking. All these negative self-talk, and it's even something today where I think I've let go to my best ability of all these things, but still, 
I have negative self-talk. I criticize myself so much because that's what I remember being okay. And it was something I accepted for so long that now it still even amplifies. But um, yeah, advice I would have for um, people who are going through that is just reflect, really find out, um, are you happy right now? How can you make your life happier? And I would say reach out for help. Really, that's what mm. got me through like being bullied was actually finally uh, releasing the fact or at least the thought in my mind that if I tell people, I'm going to be a burden on them. Mm. And that's the last thing I wanted to do would be burdenous on my family, be burdenous on friends. And so just release that like self-limiting belief of I'm going to be a burden to them because sometimes when we hold these rocks and this weight that starts to build up on our shoulders, it comes down to a point where there's so much weight that we come crashing down. Mm. And so we yeah. need to have someone else help lift up those rocks. We need to help relieve that weight. And so it's kind of like a helping each other. Like I help, I lift up the rocks off your back, you lift them off mine and you know. Yeah, so find like a really good unit of mm -hmm. people that you can really actually trust, yes. you know. I think that's really big, big advice. You know, you obviously grew up online, social media. You were doing YouTube videos yeah. when you were two years old, I think, when you were, you know, two and three, when you could first speak, you were actually, you know, doing YouTube videos. And we were constantly doing Wisdom of the Day with Hanalei and all this, you know, this, this stuff that gets you comfortable with communicating. However, you also grew up in the, in the world of social media. You know, you grew up in a whole different world than I did. Yeah. I didn't have a phone when I was growing up, right? Yeah. Our farthest we would do is running down the streets on our bikes mm -hmm. until the sun came out or until the sun went down because in the, the street lights came on because yeah. my mom couldn't call me, right? Mm -hmm. But for you, we've been able to contact you, but you've also been exposed to a lot of things that I never were, was exposed to or even information yeah. I was never exposed to. Do you think that society, social media, or even adults, that we're failing the youth of today? What is your opinion on how social media has affected your uh, generation? Yeah, um, one thing that I can say is social media has so many, has done so many incredible things. Been able to lift, uplift so many messages, been able to support so many people around the world that we've never been able to be connected with. Mm. We've been able to share so much information. There's so many great things about social media, but with every good thing in life has something negative that mm. comes with. And I can only speak from my personal experiences of growing up on social media, of course, but um, I feel like social media has done so much harm to our youth's mental health how we think about ourselves, how we perceive ourselves. Um, and especially like we can look at magazines or something and like be like, oh, these girls um, are so skinny. They're like so perfect and I'm not that. And we can maybe just like push that magazine away. But with social media, we're constantly getting fed mm. over and over again. Every single time we open our phone, every single time we get a notification, we're constantly getting fed this self-negativity to make you buy something else. Mm. So let's say when we look at trends, a lot of the time uh, when trends come into play uh, and you see so many people around you start to partake in these trends, let's say it's a certain bathing suit or it's a certain hairstyle or something, um, we look at it every single day and we're like, I want to be a part of that, but I don't look like that. And it finds us uh, putting ourselves in a space of insecurity of like so many people look so skinny on here. So many people have perfect makeup, perfect eyes, perfect hair. And it feeds this negativity of if you do not look like this, you are not worthy. Yeah. And if you do not follow these trends, you are not beautiful. It feeds all this unconscious negativity. And I even remember like... Uh, looking in the mirror and actually asking myself like do I love the person that stares back at me mm. and almost getting brainwashed to a point of saying no and actually staring at myself and not believing that oh like pointing out all these features that I didn't even think about when I was younger like when I was seven I didn't look at my stomach and say 
oh, I'm like, I'm fat, you know? I didn't look at my hair and say, oh, this is so like, why can't it be more straight? Why can't it be more flat? Before, I just loved who I was because it was my body. I didn't even care about mm. how I looked. And now I'm like, oh, do, do these pants make my legs look good? Am I tall enough? Am I skinny Gosh. enough? All these things that we think that before we didn't even have any insecurities, but these insecurities have now been implanted in us. So these, much more even when I grew up. I mean, yeah. when I grew up, I didn't see all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have as much yeah. as you have. So you think that that is really affecting. It's like programming, mm -hmm. you know, young women, yeah. which, you know, we care so much about the mental health and the state of where we are. And um, I think social media, you're right, it's done some amazing things, but it's also, yeah, it's done some painful things, you it's know? And our kids get yeah. stuck in this trap. Yeah, it's amplified these negative uh, negative views of ourselves, and especially for women mm. um getting fed these ways um these like images of how our body should look how we should act how we should present ourselves we should be kind we should be soft we should be able to uh be this perfect woman this perfect girl and um it's really feeding us into a space of conformity and not being able to be different and finding no beauty and uniqueness. So I think that as we move forward, it's like trying to show our beauty for who we are originally and naturally and remembering that we don't have to change for anyone else. Mm. That one thing I want to really push, especially on social media, is just showing up authentically and showing up naturally because we always put so much makeup, we do our hair, we wear nice clothes, but this is, these are things that hide the insecurities that hide within our skin. Mm. That we, this is another way of putting on a mask to make other people like us more, to make other people think that, oh, they're so nice, they're so perfect, they look beautiful, you know? But when you don't feel beautiful, it's a different feeling. Yeah. It's a different energy, you may be able to look gorgeous, but if you don't feel it, if you don't convey that beauty, you're just amplifying your insecurities even more. So. Yeah, I think it's a really big message for, the, I mean, for the world. I mean, not just for, you know, teens your age, but for the world. Um, you know, it's such a, it's something to, to really be aware of. You know, we talk a lot about awareness, you know, and when you're aware of something, you can still fall in the trap, but when you're aware, you're actually able to see it and be able to pull yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that it's just, uh, yeah, it just brings you down to a space of like, what it makes me think, like what have you know we done? What have we allowed in this, this planet to come to that we've got children and young girls, you know, committing suicide? I mean, things are really aggressive. And the last couple of years has been very challenging. Mm -hmm. And I remember like when you started your first company, you, the women at your first fashion show, you didn't have them wear any makeup. They weren't completely done up. And was there a reason behind that? Yeah, um, the main reason was because I wanted to appeal, uh, people to show up naturally as mm. who they are. And um, one thing that I realized from going to fashion shows, especially being uh, like 10, 11, 12, like around that age, uh, I remember going to like New York Fashion Week, uh, like London Fashion Week, all mm -hmm. these things. And I remember watching these shows and all of the women in there were, just perfectly cut people mm. who were supposed to just convey this look of beauty it's being super skinny super thin not smiling poised every step has to be perfect and it was almost putting this like i remember feeling like oh they're not happy what they're doing or maybe they were but at least how i was feeling like the, there's no happiness there's no life there's no human it's like you're having a robot walk on stage and so when I had my first fashion show, I literally told the girls, I'm like, dance on stage, take off your shoes, yeah. flow your hair. I want you to be human mm. because I'm making these pieces for humans. So I want you to convey that energy of happiness, that energy of love. So people who want to feel loved, who want to feel happy, good in their own skin, confident, they can 
bring that energy out in a way. Mm. So let's talk about your fashion. You yeah. took a little break. Yeah. What, took, what, what happened in the last couple of years? Like, what were you doing the last couple of yeah. years? Because you really didn't take a break. Yeah. We just closed down the studio and, and then you started to focus and you went inside, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, one thing, uh, just to like touch on taking a break and stuff. Yeah. Uh, one of the best lessons I've ever learned is living by your highest values mm. and doing what makes you happy. And this was something that uh, I talked with Martini about, mm -hmm. was living by your highest values. And I remember um, getting, I was loving fashion for a while, and I slowly started to become a little more overwhelmed, stressed out, and I realized I wasn't really happy doing what I was doing. And so I, I'm very thankful that I had the opportunity to be able to step back for a bit and kind of break my little glass box, step out, and take a break from being able to do fashion for a bit. And recently from taking a break, from being super immersed into it, from being able to step out, I'm slowly able to step in. And so even right now I'm making a new collection. Which All right, I'm what's it about? Very excited. Uh, so I'll show. Well, I'll what's share, the inspiration for this one? I'll share a little bit. Okay. Um, because I still want to have like, a big <laughs> reveal and stuff. But this um, this collection is uh, the working name right now is Goddesses by the Sea. Mm. And so I've been surfing for probably the last three years, and surfing has been very close to my life. We live by the ocean, and um, I've always felt very in touch with the sea. And I really want to create a collection that embodies that love for the ocean, that love for the sea, and the element of water, mm. being able to flow. One of the greatest lessons I've learned in life is being able to adapt to change and flow with change. And a metaphor for that is like a wave. We, you can either choose to ride the wave of life or try swimming against it, but you're going to just end up drowning the more forceful you are. And so that was like a huge thing where I want to embody that flow in life. And so that's what the new collection's about. And I'm very excited to share more. I've been working on designs and I'm very excited to start getting the prototypes done and the new pieces out because I really want to make this collection about not um, needing to make it for anyone else, mm. making it for myself wow. and not needing to please anyone by oh, will these people like it? Will this, like all that stuff. I'm making artwork. And my artwork is just the embodiment of myself. And yeah, I'm really making it for me. So I'm kind of healing that part of me that was kind of like stressed out about fashion and I'm learning to find that love for it again, so. Oh, it's super exciting. I know I've got to see some of the sneaky things and it's it's so exciting though to Hanalei and I love mm -hmm. um, just watching that because I think anyone that's listening especially adults you know that we can see how we grow up doing things to make others like us doing things to please others mm -hmm. and it happens to all of us yeah. but to emerge from that and see it and have several of these awakenings and transitions even at your you know age of 15 um, I'm you know, it's like now that you know these are tools mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to use throughout, you know, your life and, and, and helping inspire other people. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited. So we've got this chapter. This book's coming out. I'm super pumped. I am incredibly I mean, excited. I am so proud of myself for this chapter. It's yeah, this the, is a big one. You, it is one of my favorite that I think I've ever written. And you wrote the, the whole chapter. Like you stayed <laughs> I sat down four for straight days. Four days in my room, sat down, full just brainstorming and writing and creating and I'm really excited for the story to tell um, and the painter I'm uh, the picture I'm able to paint mm. art is one of my favorite outlets to create things and I'm just finding my love for writing and painting with my words mm. so I'm so excited for you guys to read this chapter finally as well so yeah because you tell cool. stories about you know how you are collecting memories yeah. you use some really beautiful stories of, of what that dad spoke with you about, about what happened yeah. with his dad. Yeah. And you learn from so many of these memories. What do you think was one of the biggest memories of you traveling all your life? And, you know, like, do you remember some moments that really stand out for you? You know, because most people don't know this, but you were, you left when you were one years old mm -hmm. and you were a minority. You were a minority pretty much all your life. You lived yeah. in third world countries. You're the blonde, blue eyed girl. Most of the kids were not. They were a lot more tan, you know, more, uh, you know, cultured. Did you, uh, like, what were some of the memories that you had from those times? 
Um, wow, okay. Um, a lot of my memories growing up was usually at events. I remember um, sitting in the back of the room and listening to the speakers talk while I was painting in my little tiny sketchbook. Um, a lot of my memories as well were long nights on, on planes and <laughs> being able to visit new beaches and new experiences. I remember going to Paris for the first time and I mm. worked really hard to uh, be able to like, get my ticket to Paris. Um, yeah, remember that? What, yeah. what did you do to get, you, you said, how old were you? I think you were like, I was like eight, seven, you were seven. I was probably seven. Six or seven. Yeah. And we gave you a challenge. And what was the challenge, remember? The challenge was to get 100% on my spelling test. All <laughs> the spelling test at six years old, seven years old. And I wasn't the best at spelling, You're right. so. <laughs> but the cool thing was, is although you did get 100 mm -hmm. on every one of them, but there were some that you yeah. took over like three and four times. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah, and also, either way, we were going to travel somewhere. Right, we were going well, anyways. it's not like I like, it's like if you look at it, it's like, oh, they're, they have so much money, yeah. they can just go to Paris because she, uh, she finished her spelling bee. No. Well, it's like, no, we were going to travel somewhere, and we had like three options, and my option that I really wanted to put a foot down was Paris because right. I'd never been there. Right. And so we were able to go after I completed that little challenge. Um... But one thing I really want to touch on as well mm -hmm. is one of the most important memories or lessons I've learned growing up. Mm -hmm. And this was something that, because I can't really think of like very specific memories that meant a lot. Uh, but of course, like one of the most important memories was what do you want to be now when we were on the beach together and it was kind of that eye-opening moment. Mm -hmm. um, but something that really inspired me was I remember my dad telling me from a very young age we never know when our expiration date may be. And this was what really opened my eyes to collecting memories. Because my grandfather, I never got to meet him sadly, mm -hmm. but he died of AIDS when my dad was um, 16. about 16. Yeah. And when he found out he had AIDS, there was a switch in him because he knew he had an expiration date. There was no like, oh, I'll die one day, it's fine, I can just live my life. It was like, no, the doctors are saying I have one year to live. Mm. And when you put your life in perspective like that, you really, like, you realize that we are all going to die. And that shouldn't come as something that's like super negative, but it's like, what are we going to do with the guaranteed time we have now? And that also inspired the poem I wrote which was when we toil so much on our past and on the future, we forget the single moments that we are guaranteed, the moments we are living now. And so um, it was something that was really impactful. And from a young age, I've always done my best to um, be present, you know, like put my phone away when we're all watching the sunset or doing little things to like capture these moments that one day will be my last sunset I'll ever be able to watch. And so finding the importance of each little experience we can have in our life that lights our light up, uh, light, lights our life up, you know? Like, we have a timer that's ticking slowly down. We just don't know when that is. So if you did have an expiration date, if you knew you had an expiration date, what would you do with the time you would be living now? Would you be working a job? Would you be putting so much stress into the little things in life? Or would you do what makes you happy? Live by your highest values, be able to take time off when you need it to experience the world, all that stuff. So that was a very valuable mm. and important moment. So beautiful, Hanale, you inspire me every day. Thank you. All right, so I've got a couple hot seat questions before we go. Hot seat questions? Yep. Rapid fire, what's Rapid your favorite food? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my favorite food. Come on, wrap it. Oh, sorry. Wrap it, wrap um, it, wrap it. Mac and cheese. I don't know. <laughs> Burritos. What's your favorite color? Uh, turquoise blue. What is the weirdest thing that dad has ever done that's embarrassed you? <laughs> I, I almost can't say some stuff. He's done some. <laughs> I almost like, I don't know, like, um, 
one time we were in Japan in the onsens and we were on the women's side and he was on the men's side. And he ran on the he other hopped, side. He hopped the like <laughs> side of the pool bare naked and screamed, you've been mooned in front of my friends <laughs> when we were in the onsen. That was terrible. Yeah. There's been some really bad ones yeah, as well. Yeah, your dad has definitely done that. What's yeah. your favorite country? Oh, um, currently it changes. Bali and America, because Ooh. I really loved going on our RV trip and going on road trips there. And mm. I have so much memories for long roads, uh, long drives on open bare roads. So surfing or snowboarding? That's something you can't ask me. What are you? Well, I've been surfing for way longer, for three years. I only started snowboarding recently, but currently I really want to go back into the snow and snowboard, but. I love surfing. It will always be a part of me. I'm always mm. a surfer. Now, I'd ask most of my guests red wine or white wine, but I'm not. that's not a good um, question to yeah. ask you. <laughs> All um, of the above. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Iced tea. What flavor of Arizona iced tea is your favorite now? Are we just trying to fill time for like <laughs> <No. laughs> Arizona iced tea? Uh, yeah. Kiwi strawberry. Sure. That's my favorite. Really? Yeah. I I, actually, no. It's too sweet. It is really, really sweet. I don't think I like them at all, actually. I just like. I don't even know how you like those. I just like classic iced tea. Arizona classic iced tea. All right. Well, Hanalei Swan, is there anything more that you want to leave to the world? The impact that you want to leave? Um, the main thing is I want to leave you with this question of uh, if you knew you had an expiration date, what would you do with your life? And also a little reminder that you can truly do what you love now and sit down, think about this, write it down, actually write down like, what do I love to do? What are my highest values? And like, what are the things that I can wake up every single day and well, without anyone needing to tell me I need to do it, I will just do instinctively because those are the things that make you happiest. Mm. And think about how can you incorporate them more into your life to live a fulfilled life and enjoy a joyable life really because isn't that what we're here on this earth to do mm. be happy that's it so now I, there's one more thing that i actually have to ask you because i think people are going to be like oh trying to wonder um that oh you built this fashion company and because your parents they gave you all this money that wasn't the case though was it no what what happened how did you actually start this company i started from the bottom now we're here <laughs> um, <laughs> i started with an investment of twenty dollars that i asked from you and I started sewing keychains. I had a very unique idea. Keychains in the shape of food with human faces on them, yeah. like little smiles. And I sold them to all of your clients. Yeah. Um, I had a very charming face uh, and like a great story. And I was like seven, so everyone's like, oh, so cool. But what but was I it? told well, them. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah what no, was it? I'm getting to that. that is definitely cute, but that was not why they said no, yes, was course. it? Um, I told them the story and I told them my dream of what I really wanted to accomplish, which was I wanted, so I kind of set my mind to fashion. I'm like, I want to do this. This is going to be what I create. I'm going to be a fashion designer. And I put it in um, statements of I am. I didn't think I'm going to be. I believed in that very moment I was a fashion designer. And I put that affirmation out there. And I told them the story of, I want to one day open a shop in London, open a shop in Paris. I want to make clothing that can help the earth. And I want to inspire and prove to other kids my age that you can do what you love now by setting an example and taking action by literally creating my perfect dream life job, whatever you want to call it, by creating what I love, I wanted to inspire others. And so when I told that to people, immediately they fell in love with my story. Mm -hmm. And that's how I originally got my investment. I gave you back the $20, and that's how I made my first prototype. Mm -hmm. I found someone, I found a tailor to make my first designs, and ever since that day, I've slowly been able to grow. Yeah, and you just kept reinvesting and reinvesting, and then it slowly you know, came to, you've put out three collections now, and now we have the yeah. fourth collection ready to come out. Yeah. Super exciting. Very exciting. Thank you for inspiring me every day. Thank you. I am so grateful for having you as my daughter and for having you as, you know, my, um, not just an inspiration, but the wisdom that comes from you. 
I, uh, I, I grow from it every single day. I love you so much. I love you too. You're, you're a great mom. You're the best. <laughs> Thanks. You're my favorite kid. <laughs> I love you. Don't change. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Ditto. Well, everyone, what do you think? What do you want to be now? Have you ever asked that question of yourself? Have you asked that question of your children? How about, are you living today like you had an expiration? Are you doing right now what serves your soul? What if you had an expiration date? Would you be doing something different than you're doing right now? Because in reality, that is what we have to ask ourselves every day. Are we working to live? Or are we living to work? The possibilities are everywhere. We've just got to get out of the clouds, get out of the programming of what they tell you to do. And if you're a parent, cultivate that space, the soil for your child to think bigger. And in order for them to think bigger, you have to think bigger yourself. You have to see yourself changing doing something different, being a bigger inspiration to the world. Even if it means shifting what you do now, are you loving what you do? And sometimes that might be making way more money. Other times it might actually be making less, but imagine making way more money and being so upset with your life or not happy. What if you made a little less and you're elated? Which would you choose? Did you know you could choose both that you could make all the money that you want in the world leave an impact and still be fulfilled? See, it's all in our minds. And in order for us to be this example, these mirrors for our children, we have to do it ourselves. We have to do it ourselves. So if I can leave you with one thing today, especially if you're a parent or you're a teen, what do you love? What do you want to be known for? Don't think about what you want them to say when, you go, when you're gone. What do you want them to say now while you're here? That's the exciting part. And that's today what this show and this episode was all about. I hope you're inspired. Please make sure you follow Hanalei Swan. Her new collections are coming out. She's part of the book Women Gone Wild that launches at the end of May of 2022. Make sure that you are right now going and you can put your application in or you can fill out the form to make sure that you get the book on the list for when that book launches because this is a movement. This is a shift. We are redefining wealth. We are redefining how mothers, how women, how young women and girls are seeing themselves and we're making a difference in this planet right now. All right, hope you enjoyed this show. I'm gonna leave you with this. Don't forget to be unstoppable, be unstoppable. and stay wild. See you on the next episode. You.